Welcome to the Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And with Mike. And between us, we are rereading and talking through our favourite series of novels, the Aubrey Matron novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, here we are, one more chapter in to Post Captain. Would you mind reminding us where we got to last week and give us a sense of where we might be headed to this week? I would be delighted, Ian. Well, last week in Chapter 2, Jack, Stephen, and the Williams family got to know each other. Mrs. Williams really started pushing the Jack and Sophia connection. Jack and Stephen, though, were both completely awed by Diana. Mm -hmm. There was a ball at Melbury Lodge featuring Jack and Sophia to start it off, but Diana and Stephen had some really tough words right before Diana kissed Stephen and went off to dance with Jack. Mm. So, yeah, left a little tension there at the end of Chapter Mm. 2. This time in Chapter 3, Stephen really falls for Diana, or we learn about it, but has some concerns. Jack tries to deal with Sophia's reluctance. Tension mounts between our heroes even before their entire world turns upside down. So, as the shrunken head on the night bus said in the Prisoner of Azkaban movie, Take her away, Ian. Yeah, take it away, Ernie. It's going to be a bumpy ride. (laughs) Well, Mike, let's find out some more about the bumpy ride. We open the chapter, as we've opened so many chapters in the rest of the canon, with Stephen in journaling mode. He's writing in his diaries. And this is where we really start to to learn again and learn a little bit more about this habit that he has and the different kind of languages and perspectives that he's using. We learn that the scientific part of the diary are in Latin, but personal observations are in Catalan, the language of most of Stephen's youth. And here he is writing the day after the Valentine's Ball. He's writing on February the 15th. He says that the strength had left his knees when Diana had kissed him at the ball, which was pretty much the scene just as we wrapped up the previous chapter. And even though he had sworn never to allow the possibility of such sorrow or distress into his life again, his his journal entry in the book directly quoted here says, my whole conduct of late proves how I lie. I have done everything in my power to get my heart under the harrow. And he moves on and reflects a bit now on Jack Aubrey. He notes how helpless a man is against a direct attack by a woman. And pretty sure here he's talking about Diana Villiers egging Jack on. He talks about how women learn early in life to ward off wild love, to ward off the attention, the, the animal spirits of men. It becomes second nature for women, he says, and it becomes a commendable thing, a commendable skill, commended even by men who along the way become repulsed. The more honourable, delicate and gallant a man is, thinks Stephen, the less able he is to withstand a remote advance, not wanting to wound somebody with a a rebuttal. Uh, And Mike, not for the first time and not for the last time in this chapter, we've, we've got an intriguing bit of ambiguity Who's the honourable, delicate and gallant figure who can't withstand an advance? Is it Jack? Is it Stephen Maturin? Is it both of them? Right, right. It's so true. Now, in in this next chapter, you you and I have talked about how we've read this view from a few different perspectives. And we've been trying to figure out whether Stephen, at certain moments, is writing directly, obviously about Jack, directly, obviously about Diana Villiers, or with a little bit of ambiguity on O'Brien's part possibly about both of them. So tell, tell, tell us what he's talking about in the uh, next paragraphs of his journal here. Well, well, it's interesting. Like you say, in, in a number of these paragraphs, one right after another, he identifies immediately at the beginning who he's talking about. Yeah. This one paragraph that's coming up at the beginning of the paragraph, he does not. And his pronouns are such, you know, well ahead of his time. <laughs> that they could actually <laughs> refer. True. It, he might as well say they. So Stephen writes saying, 
you know, when a face you've never seen without pleasure and a smile is cold, even unfriendly or hostile, you see, in his words, another being, and you become another being yourself. Ah, so here we're going. Wow. Wait, wait, is this Jack's face? Is this Diana's face? Now, continuing in this same paragraph, he goes on to say that he realizes there's no pleasure living with Mrs. Williams. So huh. that makes me think, okay, he's talking about Diana. Now, was right, he right. talking about Diana in these first sentences the whole time or not? But, and he says that he, because thinking about Diana having to put up with Miss Williams and all this, should be more generous and understanding. Yeah. But he says, you know, and writes in his journal that he sees depths of barbarity that he did not expect. And he writes, common sense calls for a disengagement. So here it looks like he's really going, you know, I've said I wouldn't ever put myself in this position again. I've clearly done it. And given what I'm seeing here, I really need to get out of this situation. However, it may also, as as you're kind of alluding to, Ian, yeah. O'Brien also does this incredible job throughout the canon of writing something that not only exists here, but also foreshadows something coming. So he may be doing a little bit of that sleight of hand here as well. I bet. I bet. And I think he's enjoying it as well. I'm sure he's enjoying the way he's laid out the different perspectives that open up in this journal entry of Stevens. Now, the writing of the journal goes on and he's reflecting on how Jack is having a hard time dealing with the, the reluctance. You might say the conventional, socially kind of reticent reluctance of Sophia, what he calls her hesitation. And maybe then Diana was right uh, when she said to Stephen that it would take much more than a ball to move Sophia along, and she's talking as well about moving along Mrs. Williams too. Jack, as Stephen observes, may well not bear frustration well, especially given his recent experience with Molly Hart in Menorca. This is part of what Diana calls Jack's immaturity, part of the reasons why she thinks Jack is not long-term relationship or husband material. Jack also doesn't seem to have realised that the liking between Diana and Jack may actually help Jack with Sophia. He's not really seeing the interconnectivity of the relationships. He's just seeing two women, one, one of which he's righteously pursuing and one of which he's pursuing for non-righteous reasons. Stephen has noticed then that there's some, some doubt in Jack's gaze. When Jack is looking at Stephen, he sees signs that Jack starts to see Stephen as a rival, as somebody who's perhaps not entirely trustworthy in this particular context. And this is the first time there's been any kind of reserve in the relationship. And this is painful for Stephen, who, as we said at the beginning of the book, has so far had no major personal beef with Jack. He's pretty sure that that's also causing pain for Jack himself. And he goes on to say that he looks upon Jack with affection, but he can hardly speak about the physical possibilities of, and, and then the sentence trails off, and we're left to guess that he's talking about the physical possibilities of Jack being Diana's lover. So th that's a bit of analysis of Jack and the situation. I, th I think we're going to turn back to Diana Villiers again next, right, Mike? Yeah, exactly. You know, he, he's continuing this journal entry. And he, he writes about how Diana always insists and bullies and cajoles Stephen into inviting her over to Melbury to play billiards. And he always gives in. He says that she can beat both men easily, can spot them lots of points and still beat them. And that Stephen and Diana both talk about their friendship. And, you know, I don't think Stephen had ever heard of air quotes, but I think he would use it here <laughs> in describing it. Yeah. Yet he says, neither one of them is deceived. They both know exactly what they're doing. And he continues, and, and I'll quote this, my position would be the most humiliating in the world, but for the fact that she is not so clever as she thinks. Her theory is excellent, but she has not the control of her pride or her other passions to carry it into effect. She is cynical, but not nearly cynical enough, whatever she may say. If she were, I should not be obsessed. Ah, wow. Wow. yeah. And then he throws a little Latin tag at us. Quo me rapis. Quo indeed, he writes. My whole conduct, meekness, mansuetude, voluntary abasement astonishes me. 
Now, right. Ian, I didn't have time to talk to our consulting Latinist, Karen, this week. And I thought, I, you know, ah, well. why do we leave this so late? I should, should have gotten here. But and I, I don't even know if I said that anywhere near close. But tell us, what is this little phrase Stephen's referring to? Well, it's Latin for, to where are you carrying me off? Where, where are you carrying, carrying me off to? It comes from book three of Horace's Odes. If you wanted to translate the full line out, uh, Google or the internet helps us out here and says, the full line from Horace might say, where, O Bacchus, are you carrying me off to? So full of your wine. So it's a question about why why is the ple- pleasure of wine drinking, wh- wh- where is it taking me as, as somebody who's enjoying it? And he's wondering then, oh, oh, let's put it this way. He's kind of analogizing the pull that Diana has and the effect that she has on him as being similar to the pull of the alcohol or ah, another mind-altering substance. We're, we're going to get onto laudanum later on uh, a, a little, I think. But he's basically hinting that he feels like he's not in control. Yeah, well done. Yeah. So Stephen concludes this diary entry wondering whether his passionate feelings about Catalan independence are in fact the cause of what he calls his virile resurrection, the the rekindling of his male animal spirits, whether they're the cause of that or the effect. And he's certain that there's a direct relationship. He's just not sure in which direction the, the, the inference works. You probably remember that back in Master and Commander, he had talked about having had a, a, a former prior, very intense relationship with a woman and that that had been coincident with the time of his heated involvement in Irish independence. And he concludes by making a little intriguing reference to things that he knows about information floating around the Admiralty. He says that Bartolomeo's report should reach England in three days. I'm like, this, this is another thing that's going to start to get hinted at more and more strongly in this chapter that Stephen knows about and is even connected to the world of analysis and advice and intelligence about the forces uh, arrayed in Europe, potentially allied to Britain and potentially against Bonaparte. Well, Stephen hears Jack's voice coming down the hall, calling his name. And Jack says, you know, finding Stephen, that he was afraid Stephen had gone off to his stoats again. So remember, <laughs> we were pondering in chapter two whether there's some significance to Stoats and Stephen and Diana and perhaps Jack. So I think the fact that uh, O'Brien's bringing them up in this context, worried, Stephen, that you're off after your Stoats, is another clue here. Well, <laughs> Jack's trying to find him because he says that a carrier has brought Stephen what he calls an damned, ill-conditioned sort of ape. So this ape's been drinking at every alehouse on the journey here, is reeling drunk and offering itself to Babington. Ah, Stephen says, yeah, right. That, you know, was sent by a colleague of mine who believes it's suffering from hypersexuality and sent it so that the two of them, Stephen and his colleague, can dissect it together. And so I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in the, in the spirit of O'Brien always using, you know, so often using animals to foreshadow or kind of cast some light upon somebody else. Well, what in the world could this ape be talking about? Let's stick a pin in that. And Yes, indeed. And it just made me think that this is either the first or one of the first. We'll have to decide on how we count the master and commander Pongo reference of many wonderful apes in the canon. <laughs> Indeed. And, and the first of many animals that seem like they could be a metaphor for a part of Jack Aubrey's character. <laughs> right, right. So it's interesting. Stephen and Jack have been together eating. They've been together playing music before. They've been together drinking. But now we're going to have them together playing cards. And interestingly, they're not playing Whist, which demands another pair of players. They're not playing Backgammon. They're playing a very rivalry based game they're playing piquet or piquet they know each other's playing styles very well jack switches between risking everything on a bold hand and taking a steady orthodox defensive approach fighting for every trick and we learn without any specifics that stephen makes use of the theories of hoyle and laplace and probability theory and also of his knowledge of jack's character and by, by the way as, as any mathematician knows, Hoyle and Laplace were real mathematicians who wrote treatises, among other things, on game theory and tactics. So Stevens clearly got the intellectual edge here. 
So, as a result, he's able to beat Jack handily. He collects five guineas, which in their current state of relative kind of financial ease sounds like it's a, a reasonable stake. I, I think as the book goes on, we're going to realize that five guineas would mean a lot to these two guys in the situation that they're really in. And Jack writes off Stephen's success in the car games as being all luck. Stephen sort of joshes back at him and says, well, skill does enter it. Jack's having none of this. It's all luck. He says, you have the most amazing luck with cards. I should be sorry. Was you in love with anyone? And Mike, that's a really chilling comment. First of all, kind of reflecting Jack's subconscious view of Stephen as a rival and, and the idea that love and pursuing a relationship is a bit like a game of cards where you can gamble and win. So let's see how Jack and Stephen's styles, not only their card playing styles, but their, uh, their love making styles, how they play out in other parts of their lives going forward. That's going to be really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. How they interact with the women, how they interact. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, Jack's comment there about that he would be sorry if Stephen was in love with anyone, you know, puts a real pause in their relationship, O'Brien tells us. And they've they're headed off to London. They've trotted miles and miles down the old London road in a cold drizzle. We always know about rain. We talk about yeah. that throughout the canon here. But the rain stops about halfway, and by the time they're walking into a familiar naval coffee house in London, they're now back into their easy ways of talking about. And, and I love, you know, Brian say, hey, talking about the sea, the service, migrant birds navigating by the stars at night, an Italian violin jacks attempted to buy, and how elephants renew their teeth. So this great kind of quid pro quo collection of their mutual interests here. And as they come in, a captain that they both know greets them, saying that, you know, he was just there talking to another captain who was telling him about Aubrey's wonderful ball with girls by the dozen. So the word is getting around the surface about this ball. And he asks Jack if congratulations are in order. Jack says, well, not exactly. Perhaps a little later, if all goes well. So I guess you know, the word's out that Jack and Sophia are an item. And then the captain tells Aubrey that he should clap on now before he gets old and moldy. And so that if he claps on now, he may actually get the chance to be a grandfather like this captain someday. And he uh -huh. asked Dr. Matron to support this advice, to tell Jack to clap on. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I'll, I'll bet Stephen's thinking, yeah, you, you need to go ahead and clap on to that one. <laughs> yeah. The other is alone. <laughs> Yeah, I, I even wonder if there's a double meaning behind the word clap, but that's probably me going a bit too far. <laughs> and Mike, we, we had five guineas before as a, as a stake of cards, and we've got more signals here that so far at this point, Jack and Stephen are kind of living high on the hog. Jack says, oh, I'm, I'm just going to step in and see my prize agent, my man of business to get some ready money. He's going to go look at this violin. He says he can't in good conscience buy it at that moment because he's not that good of a player. And Stephen says, well, you earned this Amati, this violin by Niccolo Amati, famous, famous, great, one of the original um, Cremonese Italian uh, violin makers. He'd earned it by every minute that he spent on the deck of the Cacafuego. And he gives a nice little conciliatory thing here, I think, for Jack. Any innocent pleasure is a real good. There are not so many of them. So, dear friend, enjoy your innocent pleasures. I wish you joy of them. And I think he's also saying, I'm also aware that you're taking some pleasures that might be not so innocent. And Jack expresses great respect for Stephen's judgment and says, well, why don't you step by the shop when you're done at the Admiralty and we'll assess the tone of this violin? And I, I think we said in other episodes, Mike, at other times, Jack has allegedly had a Guarnerius as a violin. If he had either a Guarnerius or an Amati, he'd be getting a violin that is prodigiously rare and expensive in the modern world. But I think it's just another signal. Jack is doing okay, and he's feeling like he can shop at the top end of the market right. for violins. So good for him. Absolutely. Well, at the Admiralty, Stephen is shown right past this, you know, the huge regular waiting room packed with all these anxious officers hoping for what will likely turn out to be hopeless interviews. So, yeah. you know, it's the piece everybody's been thrown on shore. And Stephen is whisked away to another private room where he's received by an elderly man in a black 
coat. Ah, we're remembering. Oh, wait, wait. Yeah. Paragraph yeah. one, Stephen was talking to a man in a black coat that might as well have had intelligence agent or spy written on his forehead. And this man in the black coat tells him again that Bartolomeo's report has arrived at the Admiralty and that Sir Joseph will be with them directly as soon as the board, the Admiralty board, adjourns. And Stephen suggests to Blackcoat that he should probably start entering the Admiralty through a more discreet, less conspicuous entrance in the future. He says that as he was coming in, he spotted a man that he has seen before with men from the Spanish embassy kind of mm. waiting on the other side of Whitehall, watching who goes in and out of the Admiralty. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you're right. Ian. We're starting to get these. Wait, what, what's going on here? Good. <laughs> It's fascinating. I hope this is not too much of a spoiler. We're reading this with the knowledge that as the book goes on, we're going to see and hear more and more about Stephen's role in different aspects of this side of naval life. And I know that this it's a big vein of speculation that people like to mine. How far back in the canon was Stephen believed to be directly, or was he retrospectively proved to have been involved in intelligence? I think you and I both agree that there's, there's nothing sure about what was going on in Master and Commander. But here in Post Captain, we're gradually feeding in some evidence of Stephen being connected to the world of intelligence. And, and, and by the way, biographically, we know that that was part of the world that Patrick O'Brien himself had occupied during the Second World War. So here we go. Regular seamen like Jack Aubrey, as we're going to find in a minute, have to wait in line. Stephen Maturin's got some pull in the world of the Admiralty because. He is welcomed into the Admiralty by this character, Sir Joseph Blaine. Sir Joseph hurries in, apologizing, says nothing short of a meeting of the full board of the uh, this particular committee that he's on. Nothing short of that meeting would have kept him from Stephen and says that their lordships hope to have Stephen's thoughts on Bartolomeo's report tonight. So this is intelligence that's evolving hour by hour, day by day. The British had long sought to divide Spain and to have the Catalan provinces, which have the most wealth and the most industry, to have them become independent. That would potentially weaken Spain as a future ally for Napoleon. And given the pace at which Napoleon's building ships, we expect in any case that there's going to be a war with France. So having Spain slash Catalonia as a potential ally, or at least as a sympathetic neutral, you can see would have a really, really valuable potential outcome. The British, we learned, had been approached by different groups of Catalan separatists, but the Navy, as it says in the text here, following the English tradition of independent intelligence agencies with little to no communication between them, and which, by the way, didn't have people who spoke the language, know the history, or are able to tell which groups were representatives of the true spirit of resistance. Given all of those defects, it was very unlikely that they'd get a clear picture. If they were successful... Then they'd have access to the ports of Catalonia. They'd have access to shipyards, docks, naval supplies, to the city of Barcelona itself, and other harbours like Port Mahon, which was an English territory back in the previous book in Master and Commander, but which the politicians had negotiated away in both the O'Brien world and in the real world uh, in the recent peace, the Peace of Amiens. So he, here we get a little description of where Stephen sits right now, this paragraph as we hear about it. Dr. Matron, we learn, is the Admiralty's most esteemed advisor. So at this point, not written about as spy or agent, but as advisor. And the Admiralty, we learn, had been willing to overlook the revolutionary contacts, the Irish revolutionary contracts of his younger days because of Stephen's own clear integrity and disinterestedness. They had respect for his eminence in the scientific world. They knew about his landed estate in Lerida, a Catalan city, which is called La Lleida today, I think, in Catalan. And the connection between his Irish father and the foremost aristocratic families in Ireland. These intelligence agents, like this person, Black Coat, know that Stephen Maturin can be at home in Catalan and Spanish, can move about the country as free as a native, and his remaining Catholicism which had caused a bit of a tension between him and James Dillon in the previous book, that remaining Catholic faith would actually be an advantage in this setting. They would have paid whatever their secret funds allowed to retain him, but he would take nothing, and none of their delicate soundings 
ever produced what, what is called in the text, the hint of an echo, no gleam in his purse's eye. So, but more and more, Mike, less and less indirectly, we're learning that at least the Admiralty would like more and more of Stephen's not only advice, but services and intelligence gathering. And I think we're learning that Stephen might be open to it as well. At least his, his motivations are aligned enough that it seems like a realistic prospect. Right, right. Well, after the Admiralty meeting, Stephen joins Jack at the violin shop. Apparently, Jack has already been trying it out, is telling Stephen that, you know, yeah, the tone just isn't quite right. The shopkeeper saying, oh, if you had heard it in the, you know, with the fire going last week, it was fabulous. And, and Jack says, well, you know what? I'll let you know by the end of the week. And he just keeps saying, it's just so much money. But, you know, you can almost hear him secretly saying, yeah, and I think I'm going to get it. But let me just put it off a little bit longer here. Well, Jax tells Stephen that he's really vexed that he had this appointment with Jackson, his prize agent, his man of business, and that Jackson, he's been told that Jackson's gone out of town, even though they had this appointment. Now, Jack says, well, uh, yeah, that's, that's it for this trip. Let me stop by, pay respects to old Jarvie, as he calls the first lord, that yeah. taunt disciplinarian whose name was evoked in chapter four. I uh, Sorry, in chapter one. Yeah. And then, then Stephen will head home. So going home, they're caught in the rain again. Jack's horse throws a shoe. They spend most of the day trying to find a smith. The smith drives the nails in too deep. So, you know, after they ride off before long, Jack's horse is lame well before they are anywhere near home. And Jack's worried that they're about to pass through an area where some disbanded soldiers had recently tried to rob a mail coach. And he says, Stephen, you're sometimes bad about your flints. Let me check your pistols. And Stephen's very <laughs> reluctant. So Jack you know, reaches over, opens up one holster and finds a teratoma. And, you know, he's kind of holding it saying, you know, what's this? And Stephen says, oh, it's a tumor from a man's abdominal cavity, unique because it contains both hair and teeth. Usually they just have maybe one or the other. Jack throws it back in the holster, wipes his hands <laughs> vehemently on his horse and tells Stephen he wishes he would leave people's bellies alone. And then finding out he has yet another creature in his other holster, he tells Stephen, you're never going to make old bones if you don't start carrying your pistols with you. And um, I'm thinking to myself, Ian, stick a point in that. Jack's telling Stephen, you better start carrying pistols with you. Maybe maybe that'll come back later. <laughs> yeah. And we're being invited to have a low opinion of Stephen's orientation towards pistols and marksmanship. Let's yeah. Stick a big old pin in that one as well. Well put. Well yeah. put. Absolutely. Well, Jack, while he's down checking Stephen's holster, stops and feels his horse's legs and says, you know what? I think we should spend the night at this inn nearby. And Steve says, what are you, you know, are you worried about these highwaymen? And Steve Jack says, no, no, you know, I'm worried about my horse's legs. And I've got an odd feeling that I really don't want to be home tonight, which is strange because this morning I was so looking forward to being home. But now I, I've got almost the same feeling I have when it's dirty weather. And, you know, you, you have no idea exactly where you are. And you just have this feeling that there's a lee shore somewhere and Ooh. you just can't see anything, but you can almost hear the rocks grinding on your ship's bottom. And I'm thinking, wow, wow. <laughs> Ouch. It is really kind of acute foreshadowing. And, and, and by the way, I think particularly in this chapter, but then all the way through the book, we've got the use of the weather, sunshine and rain as a signifier of what's going on. And we've had pretty consistent rain for the last three or four paragraphs here. And they're ruminating on what dirty weather might lie ahead. I, I'm, I'm sure it's not only meteorological dirty weather that we've got to think about here. Anyhow, so speaking of minding the weather, we go to sit in the parlour at the Williams household. Mrs. Williams joins her girls who are having a cup of tea with some of the friendly females of the local neighborhood. They're talking to a recently engaged friend of theirs, a lady called Sophie Bentink. Yes, that's right. You heard the first name correct. Sophie Bentink. And this particular Bentink tells all her friends here about a dinner where her fiance had offered a toast to Sophie, to the name Sophie. And 
Sophia Williams's boyfriend intended connection, whatever you call him, Captain Aubrey, who was at this same dinner party, had said he would drink that toast in three times three because the name is so dear to his heart. Oh. <laughs> and, yeah, well, there are other names that are dear to other parts of his anatomy. But anyway, we'll come to that in a minute. Sophia looking amused and pleased and conscious. That's a really good set of epithets for Sophia Aubrey. Amused, pleased and conscious. Asks if Captain Aubrey had indeed drunk it as three times three. Diana quickly says that, oh, it, it, it might not be anything to do with your name. Sophie was the name of his first command. And this sets a little, a little bit of edge, I think, here between Diana and Sophie. Sophia says, we, we know that. We all know that. Like, stop trying to rain on my parade here, sister. So we've got gossip that says Jack Aubrey is very much attached to Sophie. And we've got News coming in in the mail. And now we're going to hear a little bit about the uh, the, the financial weather that's afflicting Jack Aubrey here. Yeah. The post arrives. Jack and Stephen are eating the fish that they'd caught that morning. Bit of self-sufficiency here. Jack reads aloud that his prize agent, the man that he'd invested all of his funds and all of his prize money with, has run off. He's taken the money. The company is bankrupt. And in the very next letter, we learn that the prize court has overturned Jack's prize money allocation for the taking of two neutral ships in his cruise in the Mediterranean and Jack was thereby ordered to pay back £11,000. This is a real double hammer blow. Jack says I don't have that many pence let alone that many pounds. This is the Lee Shaw that he'd been speculating about earlier on. He wonders how he'll claw off. He borrows £20 from Stephen. That allows him to return to London he says he's going to give up his claim to being made post and he's going to beg for a sloop as a commander. He's promised Sophie in any case that he'll ride with her that day and then he'll leave for London right after. So Stephen tells Jack, well, why don't you take a post chase, take a carriage, so that you don't arrive fagged out. And as Jack leaves for Sophia's, I think with an eye to his chances for a legitimate marriage settlement with Sophie, he says, please don't share this news, this news of my financial disaster with anyone yeah i think you know steven's got great advice here jack jack i know how you run your mouth don't be telling anybody about this uh -uh. so jack arrives sophie says you know you're looking terribly pale have you fallen from your horse again and she says you know why don't we just go inside for tea rather than going riding and and mrs williams happens to be looking out you know as usual and she too tries to convince captain aubrey to come in but jack insists no 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 We've got to go riding. And Sophia is still kind of inquiring, you, you know, kind of, you, you sure you didn't fall off? You sure you're all right? And mm. and as they're riding out together, Jack says, no, 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 I, I just am upset by the knockdown blow that I, I, I just received. And he explains to Sophie what's happened with these neutral ships. And, and Sophie's very upset by these wicked ship owners telling lies in court after Jack had risked his life to stop this brimstone from going into France to make gunpowder. And she says, what can be done? And Jack says, well, you know, the court's decision is final, but I'm leaving for London and I may be gone for some time if the Admiralty will give me another ship. And he says that he does not want to bore her with his affairs, but he wants her to know that he will not be, and in, in his words, I'll quote this, away from Sussex of his own free will, nor with a light heart. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, remember those words here. Okay. Well, she says that, you know, he could never bore her and insists that he take a chase to London because, you know, he's just not looking so good. And she's glad to hear that Stephen, she says, such a good friend, has, has already said the same thing and is lining one up for him. Then she says, really, we don't need to go riding today. Let's turn back. You get some rest before you leave for London. And so they they come back. They're kind of, they're talking. And as they're parting, Sophie gives Jack her hand, the text says, with an insistent pressure and says, again, the text, I do pray you have the best of fortune, everything you deserve. I suppose there is nothing an ignorant girl in the country can do, but, and Mrs. Williams interrupts them. At first, she drops this comment about, I've seen you, you know, return my daughter Sophie still intact. 
still Oof. intact. What a terrible person. Like, <laughs> oh, oh, although you, you sort of say, oh, is this the devious Mrs. Williams saying, you know what, Jack, if you go ahead and take advantage of her, this would overcome her reluctance and we could get <laughs> you two married up. But he goes on to say, you know, what are you two chatting about like a couple of inseparables? And Jack rides off. So it's interesting with the secondary characters that seem to dominate the action, even when they're not kind of front and center. One of them is Mrs. Williams. And the other one that we've heard quite a lot about in the book already is Lord St. Vincent. So we go straight to his office in London at the Admiralty. He's dictating letters to family members, to influential people, to nobility and royalty even, who have written asking for favors for ship appointments for their friends and, and kin. And St. Vincent is very skillfully fending them off, explaining why the Admiralty can't currently provide a ship for the persons on whose behalf these celebrities have written. Many people then are also waiting outside in the hall to see Lord St. Vincent. He says to his clerk that he only has time for three. Luckily, the third of those is Commander Aubrey. So in comes Jack. Lord St. Vincent tells Captain Aubrey that he'd seen him last week. His father had written over 40 letters to him, to Lord Vincent, and members of the board, and had been told that they're not going to promote Captain Aubrey for the Cacafuego action. And Jack rather loses control at this, and we know this about Jack, right, when he's ashore and he's in front of authority. He starts out reasonably well. He says he's come to drop his claim to post rank, goes on to explain how his prize agent has failed, the neutrals have won their appeal, and he must have a ship. And this is the moment where he falls foul of Lord St. Vincent. He's speaking quietly. Old Jarvie's not hearing very well. Doesn't quite catch the meaning and says, must? What is this must? Do commanders walk into the Admiralty nowadays and say that they must be given a ship? And after all the other people who've been trying to wheedle and indirectly manipulate their way into the ship, he's absolutely breathtaking that this insignificant person, this Commander Aubrey, is claiming that at some point he might have been claiming that he must have a ship. If that's the case, then what he says, what were you doing knocking down wigs and supporting Mr. Babington for Parliament? And by the way, Jack is a Tory. St. Vincent is a Whig. He's one of the kind of new generation of rationalists trying to reform the dockyards, trying to take care of the Navy and modernise it. He's been blocked by politics and he's worried about the thin majority that his Whig colleagues have in the Commons in Parliament. He says that he would have had Jack arrested for disorderly conduct if he'd been there and there must be no more talk of must. And poor old Jack realises that he's on thin ice here. He starts to try and backtrack I've expressed myself badly, he says. I I mean that the failure of my agent, Jackson, obliges me to sink my other claim and to, to no longer request a command from his lordship. Jackson, he says, has ruined him. Now, St. Vincent says, if your own imprudence had caused you to lose the fortune that your command had allowed you to win, then the Admiralty is not responsible for helping you to find another fortune. His exact words here, a fool and his money are soon parted. And in the end, it is just as well. So old Jarvie says, you've got your own self to blame and it's probably for the best. Everyone knows, he says, you touch neutrals at your peril, you make proper provision against appeal. And it's clear that Aubrey did not do that. He had squandered his money, played ducks and drakes with it as far as Lord St. Vincent is concerned. All his chat about marriage, the death of a sea officer's career, says Lord St. Vincent, until at least after he's been made post. He ascribes to Jack the behaviour of leading drunken parties for the Tories and then coming here before the First Lord and saying that he must have a ship and that his friends like the Duke of Kent prompted by Lady Keith have been writing to say that he, Jack, must be made post. And this is clearly not all adding up for St Vincent, not even a tiny bit. You can't give up your claim, he says. You never had one to begin with. And now, Mike, Jack Aubrey sees red. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, Jack is, is as you say, and he's, he's kind of on his back foot. Now he says, well, the Cacafuego was a 32-gun Zebec frigate, my lord. She was a privateer, sir, says St. Vincent. Only by a damn lawyer's quibble, said Jack, his voice raising. What the fucking hell is this language to me, sir? Do you know who you're talking to, sir? Do you know where you are? I beg your pardon, my lord. 
And St. Vincent says Aubrey took a privateer, and in his words, commanded by God knows who, with a well-manned king sloop and only lost three men and is now here prating about a claim to post rank. So St. Vincent is suggesting it wasn't much of an action if you only lost three men. You know, yeah. what, what kind of ship could you have been up against here? Well, Jack says, well, there were also eight wounded. And if St. Vincent thinks action should only be rated by their casualty list, he would remind him that his flagship, the Victory, had only one killed and five wounded at the Battle of St. Vincent. You know, side note, we've talked about this before. You know, this is the battle that made Jarvis an earl, Lord St. Vincent, gave him a 3,000 pound per annum pension from a grateful king. Not to mention that much of the battle's success was due to Commodore Horatio Nelson, as we heard earlier. But bad move, Jack. R- oh mistake. my gosh, he's thrown this out like, oh yeah, well, you know, your losses and you got all this for it. Oh my God, both men are incensed. The, you know, the first one says, do you presume to stand there and compare a great fleet action with a with a what, sir? Cried Jack, a red veil appearing in his eye. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, geez. Well, you know, O'Brien switches our perspective. He says, outside the office, the voices abruptly stop. Jack walks out, hurries down the stairs, and vanishes into the courtyard. So Things have gone south in a hurry. And, and oh, I'm thinking to myself, well, Jack may have been mistaken when he thought he'd found his lee shore earlier. I think the grinding of rocks is now loud and clear. But, and by the way, Mike, this is one of those, those really memorable set piece conversations from the canon. And if I'm not much mistaken, this comes from a real interview between the real Lord St. Vincent and somebody else we know, right? Mm-hmm. You know, St. Vincent kept great records, wrote lots of letters explaining stuff and everything. And this, a lot of it comes from an actual interview between Lord St. Vincent and Thomas Cochran. So, Sloop Speedy, some of our friends out there, this is Thomas Cochran again. Good stuff. Well, Mike, I, I think we need Tempest to calm down after the interview with the, with the First Lord here. What, what do you say to a glass of something calming? Um, and we'll be right back, maybe, after this short break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. So welcome back, everybody. I hope you're ready for the second half here. It's a pretty full episode this week. It's worth just mentioning before we get back into the chapter that uh, we really appreciate you all patronizing the Lubbers Hole merch store on redbubble.com. We're going to be closing down the merch store in the next few days. So if you want to make any merch purchases with the last of your Christmas holiday funds, then now is the time to do it. Uh, we'll be taking the merch store down. I think that was just a, a, a fun one-off. So thank you again for everybody who's patronized it. And uh, we really appreciate all your support. And we hope you're enjoying your caps and your drinks coasters and your uh, baseball hats, wherever they might be taking you. So we opened the chapter in Stephen's diary and we continue the chapter again in Stephen's diary. Uh, We've gone ahead quite a few weeks here. We're now in early May, May the 3rd. Even though Stephen had, as we just heard, asked Jack not to speak to anyone about any of these financial problems, he had done. Mrs. Williams then, having an eye for what might be going on, had used her diabolical energy to get the information out of Sophie and to spread it all over the countryside. She had then blackmailed Sophie with Mrs. Williams's health, packed the three girls and left for Bath to take the cure. Stephen thinks that if they'd only managed to hang on to the news for another week, Sophie and Jack might have had an understanding and Sophie might have held on to her engagement to Jack come hell or high water, but they haven't had the chance to, to, to meet and agree as a couple that they're committed to each other. Sophie's been whisked away, as far as Mrs. Williams is concerned, just in the nick of time. Stephen knows about this because he's been getting notes from Diana and has had a visit from Sophie. He sees Sophie as an innocent child and sees Diana as somebody who was probably exquisite as a child, but now had this streak of ruthless but innocent cruelty. 
And he's writing in the diary here about what he thinks about these two women and their behaviour. Circumstances, he said, could not be worse. Sophie is gone and Jack's strong animal spirits and feeling of neglect are strong. So he's, he's hinting in his diary that he thinks there's a very high likelihood that Jack is going to act his way out of this situation by pursuing a liaison with Diana. Now, Stephen gets to sit and talk to Jack. He says that Mrs. Williams had indeed taken the girls to Bath a week ago Tuesday. Sophie had come to Stephen to say that she regretted it extremely. Jack takes the huff a little bit at Sophie's behaviour and says, well, she didn't leave a message for me. And Stephen exculpates her, he says. She didn't leave a direct message, that is to say nothing in writing, and it was hard to follow her spoken message because she'd clearly been in a high emotional state. Stephen says, in her agitation, Miss Anna Colluthon, as it says in the text, was overcome by her position, an unattended girl calling on a single gentleman. And, and, and Mike, this is this is a couple of nice things here. This is partly uh, a, a little signal of how Sophie's a proper young lady who plays by the rules and is willing to go ahead living under her mother's thumb, but nonetheless can go against her mother and will on occasion act to see a single gentleman alone. This Anna Colluthon, Anna Colluthon, seems like it might be an O'Brien hint. To tell us what it's an O'Brien hint of. Well, it is. This is a word, there's a Greek word, Anna Colluthon, which literally means not following. So in English, Anna Colluthon has several meanings or interpretations about inconsistent or incoherent sentences, kind of when one part it doesn't follow another, not following here, you know, especially a shift in an unfinished sentence from one syntactic construction to another. An example would be, you know, you really ought, well, do it your way. So this kind of yeah. mismatch here, mm, it's also used as a rhetorical device. It's often used in literary writing to express excited or diswrought emotions or thoughts. So Stephen, here has taken that literary device up several levels. Clearly, you know, Miss Anna Kalyathan was excited and distraught. So, yeah. Well done, Stephen. <laughs> now, although Sophie was a bit hard to follow, Stephen says that she had been telling him to pass on the message to Jack that she, and count the words carefully here, she did not leave Sussex of her own free will or with a light heart. And Mike, I I had never spotted that in previous readings, but that is exactly word for word the way that Jack had told Sophie about his intentions when he was leaving a couple of paragraphs ago. Now, this we, we had mentioned that they hadn't had a chance to have a direct face-to-face -face declaration of mutual feelings, but her using that language back to him, it, it really sounds like the next best thing, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. Yeah. I don't know. It might be a little too subtle for Jack to notice right. with all that's going on in his life. But for me, it was like for her to say, you know, it's kind of, like, you know, all I was hearing was I do, I do, or will you? Yes, I will. Kind of. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, Jack slides right by this and asks Stephen, you know, if he might be able to write to Sophie undercover through Diana Villiers. And Stephen says coldly, O'Brien notes, that Diana has remained at Mapes. So, you know, Jack's been a long time in London. He's back to find out that the girls are gone and to find out that Diana's still around. Well, as this is going on, uh, O'Brien tells us that the news has spread over these months throughout the community and that some naval officers that live close by were also impacted by Jackson's failure. And so now the extent of this disaster is clear to everyone, not only the general disaster, but the disaster to Jack Aubrey. And on top of that, as, as if to make matters worse, the newspapers are all reporting that General Aubrey, Jack's father, has had a new son by his new wife. So, mm. man, man you know, things are just like, oh, no, ouch, ouch, ouch. It, it, it's yeah. funny, just a chapter ago, we were saying perhaps the worst thing that could happen would be if General Aubrey had another son by his new wife. That's not the right. worst thing that could happen. No. <laughs> but, but it's bad enough. <laughs> right, right. Well, over in Bath then, yet another shift of perspective. We get, we're getting lots of moving around in this chapter. Over in Bath, Mrs. Williams 
tells her daughter that the troubles of Captain Aubrey are divine retribution. Yeah, God's punishment because she wasn't deflowered by Jack so that she couldn't be snared into marriage. Huh. She reminds them that she herself, Mrs. Williams, had heard that Jack was a sad rake. She'd never liked him from the beginning, which is complete nonsense. Uh, just a few paragraphs ago, he was very much the thing, as I recall. Even her daughters gain say this a little bit. Frances cries, oh, mama, and reminds her that she said he was the most gentlemanlike man she'd ever seen, and so handsome. Mrs. Williams has no truck with this back chat from the daughter, sends her away with no pudding. And uh, we discover that around Melbury, many people had been saying similar things and criticising the lavish entertainment and the spending of Jack, given his new impoverished status. He's had to sell off his horses. He's told his household servants that they'll have to find places whenever they can. He stops giving dinners. His credit falls off. His invitations to social functions fall off. The only other place that he dines is with Mapes, with Diana, the parson, and the parson's wife and sister, which is a very odd society to be dining in. And on this one particular evening, Jack and Stephen had ridden home after one of these dinners. Jack threw out an invitation to play cards, which Stephen turned down, saying his mind was elsewhere. Stephen goes upstairs, but Mike, he's not going to bed, right? No, no. Later that night, we joined him walking over Polkerry Downs, being careful not to be seen. And he arrives back at Mapes, but he's not going to the front door. He's going to a door at the base of a tower. And he thinks to himself, I take my happiness in my hands every time I come to this door. And he tries the handle to see if it's locked or unlocked. Is he, you know, is he, is this a lucky night for him or not? It's unlocked. And he walks up the spiral staircase to the first floor where Diana lives. She's got a little sitting room and then off of that, her bedroom. There's no one in her sitting room. So Stephen sits down and he looks over at this embroidered sari that's, you know, being now in the process of being turned into a European dress. So, you know, a, an outfit that Diana had brought with her from India. Now she's kind of sewing it to wear it here. And on that, there's all this embroidery, different perspectives on a scene of gold tigers, this gold tiger tearing into a company officer who's lying on the ground with a brandy bottle in his hand. Mm. And it's like, whoa, what? Yeah. And so I'm thinking, okay, to myself, right, because this comes up again and again here. Is this Jack, a company officer, lying on the ground being torn apart by a tiger or tigers, his present difficulties? Of course, we know that Stephen's also an officer with difficulties yeah. of his own, his own. Is, you know, <laughs> going on here. So I don't know. Uh, you know, let's stick a pin in that. Well, Diana comes in from her adjoining room, you know, and O'Brien says she has two shawls over her late dressing gown, telling Stephen how late he is. She says, <laughs> though, that she was about to go to bed and there's no welcome on her tired face. She notes that Stephen has walked again and says, what, you're not allowed at night? People might think you're married to Aubrey. And then she says, you know, speaking of Aubrey, how are his fares going? And Stephen says, well, there's, there's no real improvement. And Diana says, but Lady Keith, and stops. And Stephen realizes that Lady Keith had, you know, that Jack had, had indeed received a letter from Lady Keith that day, I guess with some better news, but there had been no mention of it at dinner. Ooh. So for Diana to have known about it, she must have seen Jack at another time that day. So Stephen silently looks down at the embroidered company officer, you know, underneath the lion here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Diana sees him doing this. And then Stephen's realizing that in these different patterns of this officer and the tiger sometimes his face is gay even ecstatic and sometimes it's completely agonized and now i'm thinking okay o'brien you're, you're, you're kind of making this you're pretty clear here, here. <laughs> well diana turns very cold she tells stephen if he thinks he has the right to ask her for an explanation he's wrong she says she and jack happened to meet when they were out riding today 
And she continues saying that just because she's let Stephen kiss her once or twice allowed him to come see her when she was ready to fling herself down a well or maybe even play the fool to get her away from her odious life here. That doesn't make her his lover. She's not his mistress and never has been. I'm thinking, whoa, whoa. Now, we're going to talk in this chapter about the the different sides of Diana's attitude to Stevens, but here she's really putting herself in in high status mode. She's saying, "I have power, I have agency, and you have very little of it, my friend." S- Stephen goes into low status mode. He says, "This is all fine. I I know this perfectly well. I'm not here for an explanation. I assume no right." He comes up with a great Stephen line here: "Compulsion is the death of friendship, Joy," and. That's a great phrase. I don't know where it comes from. He goes ahead and asks her for a drink. And she suddenly, in this strange return to civility, says, oh, I beg your pardon. Now she pours a brandy and Stephen kind of shuffles topics a little bit and asks her whether she's ever seen a tiger. He's obviously looking at this picture out of the uh, the corner of his eye here. She says she has. She has shot a couple. So again, we're in a moment in the chapter where we're speculating about the capacity for cruelty that Diana has, and it turns out that she's she's shot tigers in her time. Diana says, well, it's cold. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bed. You can come and sit by me once you finish your brandy. So he's not getting dismissed yet. She's not kind of ringing the bell and saying, okay, go away. She's got some reason to have him still sit with her here, I think. So there's the tiniest glimmer of hope for Stephen. Well, Jack's naval and legal business continues to grow darker and more complex. In addition, he's been to Bath twice to see his old friend, Lady Keith. And the first time he visits, he calls on the Williams and and sees Sophie in the midst of all her family. Now, the second time he goes, the text says that he just happens to meet her in the pump room. So I guess he's been kind of barred from the family gathering, but the two of them somehow have managed to find each other secretly here. And Stephen's saying that, you know, every time Jack returns, he's elated and tormented, but more human and cheerful, more the man that Stephen has always known. I kind of implying that, you know, for a lot of the time right now, he's not the guy that Stephen's known for a long time here. No, no. And and Mike, earlier on, we were speculating about exactly who Stephen was talking about when he was expressing frustration about the disliking and the potential of a break. It's absolutely unambiguous now. In the diary entry, he says that her hardness chills his heart and also other parts of his body. He sees in her this very strong desire that she has, what he calls a desire to rule, jealousy, pride, vanity, everything except a want of courage. He goes on to add other faults, ignorance, bad faith, inconsistency, and he would say heartlessness, except for how he describes their most recent farewells, where she's been unspeakably pathetic and so wild, he says. Perhaps an abundance of style and grace are in fact a virtue. He asks himself whether that's the same thing. Um, But he says he's had enough. If the wantonness that he knows about between her and Jack continues, he's going to go away. It's contrary to her principles and to what he believes is her real nature. She can't want Jack as a husband. So perhaps her motivation is uh, hatred. It's revenge on Sophie or on Mrs. Williams. In any case, Stephen supposes that perhaps Diana has what what he would call a delight in playing with fire in a powder magazine. Ooh. Wow. Ooh. So Ooh. Th- this is not a happy interview, another happy kind of post-liaison follow-up diary entry by Stephen. But he and Jack are still together, right? They're still meeting up and they're still going about their, their everyday social life. Yeah, they are. Stephen knows that Jack is off to a cockfight and he goes to meet up with him this uh, you know another day where jack has bet five guineas the five guineas is back again yeah. the last time we saw it ah just a pittance now jack has no money he's borrowing money from Stephen, but yet he's over here betting five guineas on a rooster 
that loses most of its vision in the first flurry of fighting. This rooster, one eye gone, blood gushing over the other eye, looks for his enemy, sees his own shadow, goes after it, and receives a death wound from his opponent. But he doesn't die. He stands until the weight of his exhausted opponent bears him down. An opponent that O'Brien tells us is too lacerated to rise and crow. So the match is over. Jack's lost his five guineas. They go and drink sherry outside and talk. And Jack says, you know, that bird didn't really want to fight. And Stephen says, yeah, but he was a game bird nonetheless. He says, you know, why, why did you bet on him? And Jack says, well, he had a rolling walk like a sailor. He wasn't bloodthirsty, but once he was challenged, he would fight back. He had courage and went on when there was no hope at all. He says he's not sorry he backed him and would do it again. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what is this story telling us? You know, and perhaps telling us about Jack and, what, you know, how Jack's going to act going forward here. You know, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, I, I was reading back this couple of paragraphs about the cockfight, expecting to find the, you know, the first word of each sentence would add up spelling M-E-T-A-P-H-O-R or something like that. It's like... Oh right, yeah, all right. of, it's it's carrying a lot of weight. This passage, in terms of the all the bits of symbolism and uh, significance that O'Brien wants to give it. Anyhow, Stephen hands over to Jack then two letters. One he's carried from the Admiralty. It's a routine note. The next is from Lady Keith. Yeah, she who's been involved as a peripheral character a couple of times now in this chapter. And this is a real bombshell. The letter from Lady Keith says that she's heard that Sophie Williams is to be married. Some fellow with a big estate in Dorset has made her an offer. Mrs. Williams has told Queenie the news of this offer. Jack asks if Stephen would have believed it of Sophie. He finds it really hard to credit. Stephen says he doesn't. I don't actually believe the truth of the report. He said, and by the way, once again, Stephen, the intelligence agent, critically evaluating his sources coming to play here. He says that he suspects the offer was made to Mrs. Williams, but not to Sophie. And that doesn't really appease Jack. He has this really dark, angry expression. He wishes he was in Bath. He can't believe Sophie, who he has this, he has this memory of her pure, pure, innocent face and all those recent sweet, kind words. He can't believe that Sophie's entertaining marriage offers. Stephen tries to say, don't be in such a hurry to believe what you read here. It's probably all Mrs. Williams. But then he realizes he might as well be talking to a mule. Jack goes on. He'd been thinking about how he'd found a uh, a straightforward girl. He thought that she would bring nothing uneasy or complicated to his life. But now this. And they head for home. They get home. And the situation from the other night is reversed. This time Jack begs leave. He says, I'm not fit company. I'm going to borrow Stephen's cob, his, his horse, so that I can go over to the next town. Yeah. This is, you know, this is fascinating to me. You know, Jack's had to sell all his horses. So now here he is asking Stephen to borrow his horse because, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go blow off a little steam here in the next town. Yeah. Well, later that evening, you know, we've got Stephen walking across Polkerry again, but much faster this time. And when he arrives, he sees his horse tethered outside Diana's tower. So this is exactly where Jack's come. So Stephen turns around and heads home. The next morning at breakfast, he tells Jack he must leave him. And Jack says, well, gosh, Stephen, you do look miserably hip. And, and I'm sorry that I've been so wrapped up in all my own unhappy business not to have noticed before. I hope you're not ill. Why don't you let me call in Dr. Vining? I know he's not as good as you, but he could see it from an outside perspective. Stephen says, no need. I know the disease. I've had it before. Mm -hmm. gives it a Latin tag and says, you know, he knows that he won't die of it. And Jack says, you know, Stephen, are you making game of me? You're going to Ireland to cure the taking away of the sun. Ah, Jack, actually a little facile with the Latin here. Yeah. Stephen says, no, no, that was just a dismal le little joke. And I'm not going to Ireland. I'm talking about going to Spain. I've got to tend to my house in the mountains. I need to look after my sheep and the bats that I've watched for generations. Well, the mail comes. There's nothing for Stephen. And that reminds Jack. He says, oh, oh, Stephen, I've got a note for you. Diana asked me to give it to you. You know, I just happened to see her yesterday 
And she gave me this note while saying all these handsome things about you, Stephen. What a great shipmate you are, a great friend to me, how she thinks the world of you. Wow. It's, I, I don't know what kind of a setup that is, how much of that genuinely comes from Diana and how much of that is Jack gilding the lily that he's handing over here. Stephen reads the note and it's a pretty harsh note from Diana. She says that he treats his friends shabbily these days, no sign of life for so long. She says that she, Diana, had treated him shabbily the last time she saw him. She does beg forgiveness and blames it on, she says, the, the east wind or original sin or the full moon or something of that kind. So she's aggrieved. She's a little bit confessing of her own shortcomings. She invites him to come to see her that evening. She has a butterfly collection that she's discovered that belonged to her father, and she thinks that's the the temptation here. So it's a little bit shallow, but very smartly judged of her to think that he'll come for just a bunch of butterflies. Jack says that he's invited Diana, in fact, to play music with the two of them on Thursday. But if Stephen's leaving to head off to Ireland slash Spain, he can cancel. Stephen, having just read this note from Diana, says, well, 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 I might be being hasty here. I can stay a bit longer and see what next week brings. And, and they're both very shallow. I mean, it's partly funny, Mike, but it's also sad, you know, that they've gone from having a friendship that's really just based on this really deep respect and liking for each other to this little extra shallow layer of deception and self-denial. It's very silly. So I, I said there was a reversal of roles coming up. Here we go this time. Stephen writes to see Diana, and we're kind of wondering what this particular visit is going to bring. She opens the front door to him, not the tower door this time, even before he manages to knock. She is smiling. She's in spirits. She's in high good looks. She says she's being very formal coming to meet him at the front door. All the servants are out, and so she's very happy to see him. And she says, come into my lair. I've spread out the butterflies for you. And Mike there. Come into my lair and insects just made me think of praying mantises and master and commander all over again. Yeah, said the spider to the fly, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and it seems like Stephen's having none of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. He, you know, Stephen says, now actually, you know, and, and I think he's invited, you know, the reason I've come to the front door, not to your bedroom door, is I've come to pay my adieu. You know, I'm going to be leaving the country soon, probably next week. And she says, well, you know, how can you abandon your friends? Poor Aubrey, surely you can't leave him now. What will he do? And then she says, what will I do? You know, I won't have anybody to talk to or misuse. And Stephen says, will you not? You know, meaning, oh, yeah, you still have Jack to talk to plenty and misuse. And I think she takes his meaning. She asks if she's made him very unhappy. And he says that she's treated him like a dog at times. She says, I'm so sorry. And I'll never be unkind again. She says, but if, if he means to go, he must come up and see the butterflies that she's put out so prettily for him. Then he must kiss her like friends do when they say goodbye. And, and then he can go. And, it's, you know, I, I think Stephen sees this a mile away here. It, I mean, it's, again, we, we said it's kind of agonizing to see Jack and Stephen being shallow. It's kind of agonizing to see Diana being so petty and manipulative as well. Stephen says that she knows how pitifully weak he is with her. Even though he's got some rehearsed words that he could say that he's come to break and to do so in kindness and in friendship without any bitter words, he now finds that he can't do so. And Diana says, break? Oh dear me, that is a word we must never use. And Stephen, who has lost all of his... Uh, you know, all of his all of his gumption and his commitment to breaking off with her agrees, he says, never. And Mike, as it's funny, as I get through the, the latter part of this paragraph, I'm seeing more and more that Diana really does want Stephen. For all she is cruel and willful and manipulative towards him, she really needs him. And she really cares about the we. Yes. Uh, and... It also so happens that when she talks about that, he can't resist. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And it seems like it, I, I was getting that same kind of, I don't know, that sense of, wait, 
underneath all this stuff on the surface, there's a little something down below for both of them. So we'll yeah. we'll keep, you know, I'm sure we'll come back to here. I, I, I believe that Di- the Diana and Stephen relationship might might pop up again once or twice. In yeah, the maybe canon. so. Maybe <laughs> so. Maybe so. And maybe, you know, maybe for good reason. Who knows? Yeah. Well, but five days later, Stephen is again writing in his diary. He says that he finds it really painful to deceive Jack. And that Jack tries to delude Stephen, too, because, you know, I think more so because of what he thinks Stephen would think that Jack's conduct, what it should be towards Sophia. And and Stephen would think less of him that he's messing around with Diana, perhaps not so much of this rivalry thing here. And Stephen says that Jack's efforts are persistent, but ineffective. In other words, he's not fooling me here. And he says that, you know, he really doesn't want to go away from Jack with Jack and his present difficulties. And and he has to wonder why Diana is increasing Jack's difficulties, you know, like trying to say, Stephen, don't you leave, but she's making it worse. And he's thinking about what's her motivation? Is it mere vice? He said, in another age, I might have called it diabolic possession. And then he kind of thinks, well, maybe I'd still call it that. She just seems to go from charming to cold, cruel, and full of hurt from one day to the next. He says, however, he's heard all this from her so long that it's really lost its effect. It no longer wounds him, and his determination to break has grown stronger. But he reflects that he's finding that even a small temptation, what he might call an untemptation, can be even more dominant than a great temptation. He's writing in his journal here, he's not strongly tempted to go to Mapes, and he's not strongly tempted to drink up the drops of laudanum that he counts so superstitiously each night, 400 at present. But yet he does go to Mapes, and he does take the laudanum. And boy, this was just, yeah, this was just kind of, wow. Yeah. You know, not only is this great Stephen introspection, his yeah. journaling and diary writing, this is what made me think, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start writing in my diary again. This is, <laughs> this is so good, this inner reflection. And it also kind of thought, I thought, wait, Laudanum, have we heard Laudanum before in the, you know, in Master and Commander? I thought, well, there was a mention of it earlier, but I think this is the first time we're hearing about Stephen kind of a nightly laudanum this you know liquid cocaine habit if you will right yeah, or, sorry yeah. liquid opium habit yeah well we've got drug use we've got floundering relationships we've got floundering for personal friendship and self-deception between jack and stephen it couldn't get any worse could it well as stephen is writing all this in his diary our friend preserved killick comes in saying there are some nasty looking coves below on the lookout for the captain. He calls them prize fighters. One of them has a staff under his coat, and that would indicate that he's a, a debt collector. Killick calls them bums, sheriff's officers. So Stephen tells Killick to pack the captain's sea chest, bring it by mule and cart to the end of Foxdean Lane, along with Stevens and Jack's dunnage, their, their kind of shipgoing belongings, and be ready to flee. Stephen, having invited the bums in and into the breakfast room, he leaves them there, and heads off to find the couple that Stephen refers to as them. Now, I think I know who he means. He didn't know what it would cost him when he encountered the them, that's Jack and Diana, when he met their expressions of cold anger, resentment, and hostility. Stephen says good morning to Diana, and she gives him a look that pierces him cruelly. When she starts to comment on his long, hot walk, he cuts her off saying, you will forgive me, if I say a word to Captain Aubrey, ma'am, and he gives her a look as cold as her own look to him. Stephen takes the reins of his cob and leads Jack aside and says, Jack, people have come to arrest you for debt. We must leave tonight for France. We must then go and stay with me at my house in Spain. And he goes on to tell Jack where to find Killick with Jack's chest. If they leave now, they can catch the Folkestone packet and get across the channel if they drive hard. He bows to Diana. No, no kisses here. He bows to Diana and walks off down the hill. Yeah. Well, you know, as he's walking, Stephen hears Jack ride off. He hears Diana holler to Jack, ride on, ride on. I got to stop and speak to Matron. 
And then she rides over to Stephen and asks if he's going to leave and not say goodbye. And the text says, Will you not let me go, Diana? He said, looking up, his eyes filling with tears. No, 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 she cried. You must not leave me. Go, yes, go to France, but write to me, write to me and come back. She gripped him hard with her small hand and she was away, the turf flying behind her horse. Wow. And Mike, this is the moment where I'm now sure that Diana is attached to Stephen deeply. And yes. I, I don't know that you can call it love yet, but I also know that I, I, at this point, I don't think she's purely manipulating and controlling him. I think that she's, she's in some kind of this relationship with him. Ah. So off they go. And driving the mule and cart, Jack elaborates on this plan with Stephen. He says they can sail on the amethyst. It's, um, skippered by a captain who's a friend of Jack's leaving tonight. He's going to carry the Imperial ambassador across, so it's the right kind of transportation for them. Jack says once he's on a king's ship, the tip staff, the, the bum, the sheriff's men looking for, for debtors, can't touch him. About five miles further on, Jack tells Stephen that the last letter that Stephen had brought Jack was in fact from Sophie, direct to Jack, telling him what Stephen had been suggesting all along, which is that the reports about her engagement were all nonsense, all set up by her mother. She, in this note, sends her kind regards to Stephen and says she'd be happy to see him in Bath. And now Jack can just for a moment here be honest with his friend Stephen. Christ, Stephen, he says, I've never been so down. Fortune gone, career too, maybe. And now this. Well, later, Jack tells Stephen... What a relief it is, as they're aboard the Amethyst, to be at sea. He says, here things are clear and simple, free of the complications of life on shore. He says, I don't think I'm well suited to life on the land. And we're, we're all nodding along going, yeah, Jack, <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. You're not suited to life on the land. And uh, here's the uh, the text for the closing of the, uh, the chapter. They were standing on the quarter deck amidst a crowd of wandering, staring attaches, secretaries, members of the suite, who staggered and lurched, clinging to ropes and to one another as the frigate began to feel the roll and the brisk cross sea and Dover cliffs vanished in a swathe of summer rain. Yes, said Stephen, I too have been walking a tightrope with no particular skill, and I have the same sense of enlargement. A little while ago, I should have welcomed it without reservation. I'm like, it's, it's a very enigmatic kind of double-edged end to the chapter here, isn't it? Right, right. I'm having the same feeling you are, Ian. You know, so many things have happened in this chapter. And, you know, I want to go back and talk about those a little bit. But that was my first thing. It's like, wait, what does Stephen mean by this last line? And, and I think, you know, it almost parallels Jack's. You know, I, I've never been so down before. Fortune gone career too, maybe. And now this, like this thing that just happened is a bad thing. You just heard from Sophie that, Hey, you know, I'm not engaged. I want to tell you directly. Don't, you know, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated, <laughs> but maybe he's really down because, okay, now that I know that Sophie is available, I'm having to leave the country. And I thought, well, maybe this is a little bit of a parallel with Steven. Uh, yeah. 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 I wanted nothing but to get away, uh, you know, just a short while ago. But now maybe I've got some reservations. Maybe I don't want to leave so much. But then I'm also thinking, or is he saying, yeah, you and me, brother, heading back out to sea would have been the greatest news in the world. But now I have my, res you know, I'm thinking, oh, my yeah. gosh, like you say, it could mean so many things. And, and, and we get a little weather signal, even in that last paragraph there, there's, right. there's sunshine and rain. You know, there's a shower of rain in, 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 in summer weather. So we're not going to be allowed to think that they're escaping back into happiness life at sea we're not going to be allowed to think yet that the friendship had completely broken down but it was clearly on the rocks there's at least for us readers mike i think there's a temporary reprieve and curiosity about lots of what's going to happen next i just have to say kind of immediate reflection on the on the chapter as a whole here you know i i need somebody out there who reads jane austen much more than than i have recently to tell me we said that 
this was a lot like a Jane Austen novel. But the last chapter, we mentioned that how little time had passed before Jack and Sophie and Stephen and Diana seemed to be paired up, saying maybe that went a lot faster than than Jane Austen. And and now I'm thinking, and and maybe having everything come apart so fast was maybe a little quicker. I don't know. Does Jane Austen do this incredible amount of things going sideways quite so fast here? And as you were just saying, there's a little sunshine and a little rain right here at the end. I don't know. Jack's fortune looks like that's completely blown. Yeah. Jack's career, maybe even more so. If if his big problem before was, you know, how soon he's going to be made post after that interaction with Lord St. Vincent, I, I don't think that's what he has to be worrying about anymore. Nope. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier, to add a little salt to the wound, not only, okay, fortune gone blow up with the Admiralty and your dad has a new son with his new wife. What does that mean for Jack and for how people perceive Jack and his family connection and everything here? Yeah. And is Stephen tried to get himself over Diana and didn't succeed. I I don't know whether Jack is in any way over Diana. Um, We we can't say that his attachment to Sophie is solid because even though Mrs. Williams ruse has been, blown up for what it is that Jack and Sophie are still apart and they haven't had a proper chance to talk about their understanding. So romantically and relationship wise, I, I think, I think things are uh, at least a little in many ways, quite a lot worse than they were at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, we, we still don't have war, although Lord St. Vincent expects it. We don't have a command for Jack Aubrey, although he's prepared to take anything that will swim. And we are, have the beginnings of a career in intelligence for our friend Stephen Maturin. And so far we know of him as a bit of an innocent and a bit of a lover. So I've got to wonder, how is he going to fare if the Admiralty starts to count on him for proper intelligence gathering and proper espionage? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. There were some first in this chapter that I really liked a lot. I, I yeah. love Stephen and his diary and journaling. And so again, not not a major spoiler. We'll see lots of that. Just as Jane Austen used letters and correspondence so often, yeah. yeah, we'll use that too. But we also use Stephen's diary a lot. This whole animal foreshadowing and animals, you know, and the and and as you, I loved your, uh, you know, the the big letters. Does this spell out metaphor here? Right, <laughs> so much of that stuff. The um, and you know, some of the other first laudanum, like you said, intelligence agent. Plus, we'd heard so much about kind of Stephen's Irish side in Master and Commander, oh, yeah. and now this whole Catalan side, Catalan side, mm. is, is is opening up. So it's just that for people who are going back through again, remembering all this stuff is really cool. Yeah. Um, so, Mike, it's an absolutely mouthwatering novel to be reading at this kind of pace. I, I, I can't wait to hear how Jack and Stephen are going to get on. I can't wait to hear what's going to happen with Sophie and Diana. I can't wait to, gonna, to hear what's going to happen with history and the war and the First Lord of the Admiralty. So, my friend, what do you say next week? With just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien. With all my heart. <laughs> talking through our favourite series of novels, the Patrick O'Brien books of... The Aubrey Maturin books of Patrick O'Brien. <laughs> I'll, take another, I'll take another swing at that. Nothing, nothing like Midnight in Spain to record. <laughs>